What a great day it is to be here at Southside, isn't it? In fact, it's really good to have been back in Bible class this morning. Can I get an amen from all the Bible class teachers who, who had kids who are not as used to being in Bible class for a few weeks? So I'm sure they had uh, to wrangle this morning. Uh, it's so great to, to have our Bible classes resumed. In fact, I'm just uh, so thankful for uh, getting to teach class again. The, the, some of the folks that have consistently attended my class over the last couple of years, I mean, there's a special bondness that you can, you can develop with somebody through a Bible class that you can't get from sitting in the pew. Not even during the one morning, uh, one minute community fellowship time. I and mean, hey, I know that one minute is, is important to us, but so thankful for some of those friendships and relationships, the opportunity to open up and discuss God's Word with each other. So thankful that we could be back to that this morning. But it's not just a fun morning for the fact that we're back in Bible classes today. It's a really special morning because it is, after all, Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of you, or as my youngest calls it, Daddy Daughter's Day. Even if you don't have daughters, you are welcome to participate in Daddy Daughter's Day on our behalf. In fact, in northwest Arkansas, it's a very uh, very tornado relief themed Father's Day. How many of you uh, received new bar and chain oil for Father's Day this morning? Or or perhaps I got a chainsaw sharpener. I was so thankful for that. It's exactly what I asked for. Exactly what I asked for. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, after Andy had done some cleaning in his truck the other day, if you didn't get a Father's Day gift, ask him. I'm sure he's got enough chainsaw tools uh, to pass out to everyone in attendance this morning. I think it was a dozen that he found in his toolbox the other day. You can never have too many, though. Can I get an amen? Well, you know how so many, so many holidays have mascots? You know, Christmas, we've got Santa Claus in the big red suit. I mean, Mike Holland in, in the big red suit. And then, and then uh, for, for Easter, you've got the Easter bunny, uh, with the chocolate and the, the carrots. and uh, Hey, even the 4th of July, we've got Uncle Sam, right? Well, I would like to nominate that in Northwest Arkansas exclusively, 2024, that we have a, a mascot for this Father's Day, and that is your friendly neighborhood insurance adjuster. Uh, I would just ask to make sure uh, that you give him cookies and milk. He likes, he likes a chocolate chip, not oatmeal raisin, okay? That was just for you, Roger. I hope you Hope you appreciated that. Well, this morning we don't have chainsaw tools to pass out to everybody, but we do have our uh, traditional ink pens. So uh, at this time, I'd like to ask the teens and uh, children who would like to help uh, participate in this to to come forward and uh, grab the basket of pens. And uh, if you are a a father in attendance this morning or uh, a grandfather, uh, a father figure, a stepfather, hey, whatever the case may be, raise your hand as uh, the kids are doing the distribution this morning, and we'll make sure that you get your very special Father's Day pen. Because you're, if you're anything like me, you lost last year's Father's Day pen uh, two year, uh, two weeks after Father's Day. So time for a restock. The Father's Day pen's uh, what's become a beloved Southside tradition. And hey, if you, get to, if you somehow manage to keep your Father's Day pen until this time next year, you can trade it in for a newer model at next year's Father's Day service. Well, this Father's Day, let's face it, our dads have worked harder than ever, haven't they? You know, the tradition goes in church that on Mother's Day, mothers come and they're celebrated and uplifted, encouraged on Mother's Day. But on Father's Day, you'll notice there's a lot of dads who are uh, out camping this morning. Uh, so many of our men, hey, it's, it's a tradition that on Father's Day you get beat up a little bit by the preacher on Father's Day when you come to church. That's just how it goes. It's not my fault. I didn't make the rules, okay? Uh, but I've decided to change the rules for this year. Is that okay with you? I, I don't think that we need to be beating up on dads in Rogers in, on Father's Day in 2024. What do you think? No, I think uh, Tom agrees, so we're going to continue to preach what I've planned on preaching, Okay. Now, we do need a word from the Lord, though, don't we? And it's a word of humble acceptance. Because let's face it, especially as we are staring in the aftermath of the tornado, I mean, you're you're staring right at it this morning. Though the screen has been considerably patched, I won't tell you what that ladder looked like while Andy was up on top of it the other day, but he did it for you, okay, out of love. But let's face it, yeah, we we can celebrate that, sure. The applause was not in the script, Andy. That was not not my fault. 
But let's face it, God's plans don't always make sense. You can drive around the neighborhoods looking at the the devastation and you can say, well, where does this fit into God's plan? And sometimes we we experience tragedy, we experience heartache. I know some of you are are, are bearing some heavy burdens this morning. Sometimes God's plans don't always make sense. It's not always easy to make heads or tails of what exactly he's up to. But what if I told you we're not the first people in human history to scratch our heads at what God is doing. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, and I wasn't ready to jettison the tradition of us using actual Bibles yet. I have not put these verses up on the screen. I actually didn't factor in that the screen could be repaired in time to make a PowerPoint, let's be honest. But if you have your Bibles, hey, it's the same word. I would encourage you to turn there, Matthew chapter 1. We're going to look at the example of Joseph. Credit for this, uh, this morning's sermon does go to Joseph Crowell. He's, he's very excited. You get the credit for this one, Joseph, because I texted you happy birthday a few days ago. Happy birthday, by the way. And I thought, you know what? That would make a good Father's Day sermon. So thank you and uh, happy birthday, buddy. Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus. Joseph is a great father for us to look at on Father's Day because he's, he, he kind of is representative in a lot of ways of non-traditional fathers. Of course, uh, really operating in a very unique role in the grand scope of human history, isn't he? Serving as the, would you call him more of an adoptive father of Jesus or more of a stepfather? Now, stepfathers uh, have a certain kind of connotation, and and nevertheless, adoptive father really doesn't quite capture exactly the role that Joseph plays. He is serving such a critical role in God's plan to bring salvation to mankind, and yet we really don't know a whole awful lot about Joseph. But what we do learn here in Matthew chapter 1 is something that we can learn from. Joseph is a paragon of humility and acceptance when we don't understand the plan of God. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph... Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Perhaps now would be a good time to plug the fact that uh, VBS is right around the corner here at Southside, uh, July 14th to 17th. We have a registration station open. Hey, that's got a little ring to it, doesn't it? The registration station is out in the lobby. You can register your kids on the iPad. You can also Sign up to volunteer to pitch in to help out. And hey, after what we did with the tornado relief, I know for a fact that this congregation can come together in service. And I'd like to see a handful of folks to to sign up to help serve our kids uh, coming up here for VBS. But this year's theme, credit goes to Ocean. She came up with this one and then passed it off to me to execute. And the theme is Christmas in July. Because let's face it, uh, the story of the incarnation of Jesus Christ is so often eclipsed in December, by all the gifts and the wrapping paper and the fanfare and the men in the red suits, we're going to spend some time teaching our kids about what exactly this biblical story is all about and the fact that God sent his son, but not in the way that anyone was expecting. And along that same vein, we're looking at the story of the birth of Christ and specifically from the perspective of Joseph this morning from Matthew 
chapter 1. You see, Joseph's story teaches us about obedience and righteousness. It teaches us about faith and trust in God, about righteousness and and justice and, and humility, ultimately, and acceptance as well. See, there's a lot that we don't know about Joseph. But what we do know is that he's in a similar boat that so many of us often find ourselves in, isn't he? Because let's face it, sometimes God's plan just doesn't make sense. And in the midst of him trying to figure out his plan B on what to do about this serious conundrum that he's found himself in, this is where God steps in to offer Joseph a word of instruction and of encouragement. You see, Joseph in some ways is a stepfather of sorts, isn't he? You ever wonder what his relationship was like with young Jesus? Do you think Jesus called him Joseph? Or do you think he called him mom's husband? Do you think he just called him the Hebrew or Aramaic equivalent of dad? That's what I think. See, there's a lot that we don't know about Joseph. In fact, somewhere along the line, he disappears from the narrative. Many scholars think that, of course, by the time that Jesus is an adult at about age 30, when he began his earthly ministry, Joseph is no longer in the picture. Many scholars think that perhaps Joseph had passed away. Of course, uh, uh, a grown man who, of course, has a risky profession being a carpenter, uh, having perished prematurely uh, before one of his children could reach adulthood, this is not uncommon for the ancient world. Of course, many people think that he passed away, but the text never tells us. Perhaps that's exactly the point. Joseph was never the main character of this story. And as such, Joseph functions as a good example to us that we are not the main character of God's work in the world. Isn't that good news? It's not about our ability to be spectacular or about what's recorded about us in the history books. But instead, Joseph simply is a person who helps serve the plan of God and point people to Jesus. See, he's a paragon of a non-traditional father in a lot of ways, somebody who finds himself with a son that's not necessarily the way that he expected things to go, a son that, of course, presents an unusual, you could say, set of circumstances in terms of raising him. There's a lot that we don't know about Joseph. One thing we do know is that he has a reputation of being a carpenter. In fact, perhaps not even that noteworthy of a man. You see, in Matthew chapter 13, He's known for kind of just being a regular guy when Jesus begins doing miracles and preaching these spectacular sermons and drawing this crowd and developing a reputation for being the Messiah. Matthew 13, as well as Mark 6, Luke 4, and John 6, the Gospels are united in this. They say that the crowds, they heard about what Jesus is doing, and they said, well, isn't this the carpenter's son? That's what he is to his neighbors to his community. He's just another regular guy. He's just Joseph the carpenter, but not to us. You see, we know him as someone different, don't we? Can you imagine what Joseph must have gone through? You see, we see here in the text that he was going through quite the crisis, wasn't he? Imagine this. In the weeks leading up to your big day, your wedding, your betrothed, you ought to be doing things like planning which toaster that you should register for. By the way, we've got uh, Miss Braley here, our bride-to-be. Welcome. Uh, Of course, this is not the kind of story that you want to be uh, told about the weeks leading up to your wedding, that Joseph, while he should be contemplating what color towels to get, instead he's contemplating to divorce her quietly. Not exactly the kind of thing you want to have on the mind. I've got to do a couple of -of out-of-state weddings this spring, and I always send one last text to the groom before I get on the airplane when I'm going to do an out-of-state wedding. You know what it is? Hey, I'm about to board my flight. Any second thoughts? I don't want to get on this airplane if you're not actually going to follow through with it. Thankfully, no one's ever said yes to that one. And I always end up sitting in a just spectacular seat on um, Frontier Airlines, wherever I'm going. Of course, Joseph resolves to divorce her quietly, contemplating divorce between the wedding. This is almost a tragic story, isn't it? It's almost a story of a a broken engagement. But we learn here in the the details in between the text, we learn here, of course, that Joseph did not, he was unwilling in verse 19, unwilling, a just man, unwilling to put her to shame. Even if Joseph's worst fears were confirmed, and of course, 
They're not. The Holy, the Holy Spirit, of course, is responsible here. The angel clarifies things. That's very helpful in this scenario. Even if Joseph's worst fears are concerned, Joseph doesn't want to put her to shame. A just man, a righteous man, a person who's honorable at the end of the day, even if he finds himself in a tough spot. But let's face it, no matter what Joseph does here, the rumors are going to fly, aren't they? Can you imagine what their friends and family and neighbors thought? Oh, yeah, the Holy Spirit is the Father. Yeah, I've heard that one before, Joseph. Imagine what kinds of damage was done to his reputation. Do you think he had more trouble getting work because of the scandal surrounding his wife's pregnancy? Nevertheless, he ultimately chooses to swallow his pride and accept whatever shame was bound to come down the pipeline. Inevitable, for better or for worse, come what may, a great example of living out a wedding vow. Joseph ultimately is representative of the great Christian hymn, Trust and Obey. Isn't it? I often joke about trust and obey, that we often sing it with gritted teeth. You know what I mean. Trust and obey. Well, if there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You see, this story for Joseph is almost a little bit different, isn't it? Rather than singing it with a little bit of pep in his step and a smile on his face, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Instead, it's, it's almost a song of rebel and reject. If there's any other way, please let me have it. But instead, ultimately, the angel redirects Joseph back onto the right path. When I read the story of Joseph, I'm reminded of God's words that are revealed to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 55. What about you? Perhaps some of us need to be reminded of this in the aftermath of the tornado. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts than your thoughts. Ultimately, brothers and sisters, the good news this morning is that God is God and we are not. Now, a nuts and bolts, boots on the ground sense of things, this isn't always easy to execute. Well, I know that God's plan is, is bigger than mine, and sometimes God is doing things behind the scenes of my life that don't make sense, and I can't always rationalize or are difficult to accept. And nevertheless, we have to remind ourselves of this over and over and over as we look to examples such as Joseph's, that sometimes God has a way of accomplishing things that are counter to our agendas, to our plans, our schedules, and routines. At this time, I'd like to to play a song for you all. This is a song that I first came across uh, at a youth rally when I was in high school. In other words, I've had this song stuck in my head for 20 years, and now I can't wait for it to be stuck in all of your heads as well. This song is called Show Me by a group called Watershed Worship. It was on their 2004 album, Let Go. Uh, this song, of course, is encapsulating this idea from Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. And ultimately, it's petitioning God to help me to understand a little bit better what it is that you desire from my life. But Watershed Worship has graciously granted us permission uh, to be able to play a clip of this song at this time during worship. If you'd like to follow along with these lyrics, it's just a, a 30 second or so clip. Uh, reach down in front of the pew in front of you and you'll find a little lyric sheet that uh, a handful of us painstakingly slid under all the little baskets on, on Wednesday afternoon. So if you'd like to follow along with these lyrics, this is Show Me by Watershed Worship.
All right, I think that's good. We've got a we've got a feel for the song now. I motioned back there for them to cut it off 20 seconds ago, and Ocean wanted to keep listening. Okay. In fact, I was playing more of this album at the dinner table a couple of days ago. I said to Rebecca, hey, you remember this album from this acapella group when we were in high school? And she said, I would rather forget. Okay, uh, so if that dates me a little bit, that's just all right with me. If your thoughts are not my thoughts and your ways are not my ways, show me. Trust in me is what you say. Let today worry about today. A song about trusting God, even when his plan doesn't make sense to us. Ultimately, Joseph's story disappears into the story of Jesus. He's no longer in the story. We learn more about Mary and her, her uh, example of being a good disciple to Jesus, even as his mother uh, throughout the Gospels. And yet Joseph, he appears for a little while. He accepts whatever shame may be coming his way. He chooses to follow along with the plan of God, even if it puts him right in the line of fire from the scorn of his neighbor. Ultimately, Joseph's story disappears into the story of Jesus. Fathers, that is the best example you could set for your children. May your story, like Joseph, disappear into the story of Jesus. May your children and grandchildren see Jesus in you, the Christ-like qualities that you strive to emulate. May your story not be about you, but about how you make your life about glorifying Jesus. Ultimately, Joseph swallowed his pride, accepting whatever shame may be bound for him. His reputation will be tarnished. There's, there's no way around it. The rumors must have abounded. Nevertheless, he accepted the plan of God and took the shame upon his shoulders so that, he might, so that we might receive Christ. And this really paves the way for Jesus, doesn't it? We think about John the Baptist being the one that paves the way for Jesus, and yet in this small way, the way that Joseph accepts God's plan even when it doesn't make sense. It's foreshadowing for the Garden of Gethsemane, isn't it? Jesus, who says, if there's any other way, Lord, please let this cup pass from me. Take this from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine. You see, Hebrews 12 and verse 2 tells us that much in the same way, Jesus scorned the shame of the cross. And he went to the cross, and he suffered and died on our behalf Anyway, well, this morning, it's a certainly a, a wonderful day to be together to celebrate our fathers. Uh, of course, if you're here this morning, you have a broken relationship with your father, or you're a father who has a, a broken relationship with your children. Perhaps that piece of your story is messy, and you'd rather not talk about it. Perhaps this is a difficult day for you if you've lost a, a father. For example, we are certainly here to uplift you this morning. If you have any kind of need this morning, we would love to receive that, to pray with you. Of course, uh, I, I almost said that if you need to be united with Christ in his death, that we might have to commute to Green Valley for baptism. And yet, I have heard that uh, we've had some folks up here trying to patch the baptistry relentlessly, and that as far as we know, I'm not in my waders, as far as we know, it's holding water. Uh, so that's good news. Hey, whatever your need may be, whether it's to put on Christ in baptism or to bring some, some request before the church to ask us to uplift you in prayer, uh, the invitation is open. Let's stand and sing.